So I start the recording and then it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you and in particular uh, Dave, Dave White, which you may be seen uh, from the video and the uh, literature um, uh, for topic one. Um, Dave is uh, my counterpart at the University of Arts London as the head of the Center for Teaching and Learning, learning or something. Yeah. Something similar like name similar. Ah, same yeah. same but different i guess and uh, he's also now since this year i think the president yeah. of alt the association for learning technology in the uk and alt uh, is the leading professional body for learning technology and host for great conferences and uh, yeah um fantastic that you I still were able to join us yeah. And uh, for everyone, um, don't forget to unmute your microphone if you want to say something during the webinar. And um, if you're not uh, w uh, in the mood for sharing, then uh, would be awesome if you can mute your microphone as you did already now, I, I guess. So um, yeah, without further ado, uh, I hand over the floor to you, Dave. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. And welcome everybody. It's great to see so many people here. So yeah, this is the first, uh, the, the, the first session uh, and it's going to involve you doing some work, which is which is a good thing, I think. So uh, be prepared to uh, get paper and pen out uh, in in a in a in a little while. First of all, I'll kind of lay out the territory. Um, but what we're going to be doing is essentially mapping our own digital engagement. Uh, now, I'm normally on two screens. I'm on one screen here. So my so I'm going to have to be jumping about between things. So if it's a little bit uh, creaky as I go from one thing to the next, then that's the reason why. So let's have a look. How's that looking? Can you see the slides all right? Brilliant. Okay, excellent. Um, and do uh, the, obviously, I, I won't be able to necessarily see the text chat all the time, but do um, keep chatting in the text chat amongst yourselves, or if you want to ask a question or make a comment, I think Jorg, you can kind of pick up on those. I'll and, keep an eye on the chat. Yeah, if if something comes up that that uh, would be worth sort of um, discussing at that particular moment in time, then do pause me and and we'll have a chat about it because um, I'm trying to make this as much as, of a workshop as possible. So yeah, I'm Dave White. I'm uh, head of digital learning at the University of Arts London. It's a big. I mean, you can Google it. You'll find out. It, it's it's like a no normal sized UK higher education institution, about twenty thousand students, but all centered around the creative arts six different colleges in central London. It's quite a complex place. Uh, as I like to say, it's 20,000 students mainly doing subjects where there's no correct answer. So the pedagogy is really interesting. And talking of pedagogy, here is the, some of the stated aims about this course. Um, and I think what's really good about this course, not only the openness, but this kind of um, philosophy of openness in, in, in how you come to construct knowledge. Um, and I think really at the heart of the course is the way that the, the way you guys are engaging with the course and um, sort of discovering new, perhaps new modes of working or new ways of engaging with each other is kind of embodies the character of the course itself. You're walking the talk, if you like. Uh, and so we're going to try and do a bit of that today. So just to set the scene a little bit, I think this, this is a really great quote from Kevin Kelly in 1997. I'm, I'm normally suspicious of futurists or those kind of characters, but I have to say that this guy um, tended to say things that, that actually came to pass. And I think one of the things that's useful to think about is and we've all been thinking about a lot in lockdown is, is what does the digital bring that is different from everything else, okay? Sometimes we think about it the other way up. So we, we, we're we like, what does the digital not have that face-to-face -face does? But I think it's more useful to think about it this way up, which is what does the digital, what, what is it about the digital that, that makes it um, distinct? And I think this is a good definition of that. It's that idea of hyperconnectivity. Everything's connected to everything else. And that's fairly new and fairly unusual. 
you know, things flowing in more than one direction. So it's exactly what we're doing here. You know, the reason that this works is because I can put things out there and you can receive them. So compare that with say traditional publishing, which is like a one way street. I can buy a book, I can read it, but I can't feed back. Okay. So the connectivity and the two way street of the digital, I think is really fundamental. And I'd argue that in some senses, we haven't necessarily taken advantage of that in the way that we teach or in the way that higher education works, certainly. So we're still working in a one way street basis, even though we have this connectivity. Now, Kevin Kelly came up with this really great project, the Internet Mapping Project, which I'm going to go through very quickly because I want to get to our mapping. And uh, it's interesting that one of the challenges with the digital is we don't really we've all got maps of it in our minds, but those maps are all different. So when we talk about the digital, we're probably all imagining different things. And in this project it is literally that that you see there. The, the object of the exercise was, please draw a map of the internet and indicate your home. So here's one, here's a map, an interpretation of that from a 12 year old, which is like wires and computers, that sort of interpretation of the internet. Is a different one. I, I personally, I really like this one, the kind of swirly, whirly, slightly messy conception of the digital space with little squares on. I guess the little red square in the bottom left is their home. Another one, again, a very different interpretation, really interesting. My feeling is that that's got something to do with maybe information passing through a computer, perhaps, you know. There's no other explanation that comes with these, which I quite like. So they're and then the last one, just to see if happy faces with uh, me in the middle. Uh, and that's from somebody who's 39. So the point I'm trying to make here using this really interesting project is that this sea of happy faces and this, a load of wires and computers, are both kind of valid interpretations of draw a map of the internet and indicate your home. So ourselves and our students will be coming to what we're doing with a completely different conception or with fairly, you know, that they probably have a range of conceptions of what we mean by the digital space, what we think it's for, what we think the point of it is. And that's why it's worth having a discussion about that. Otherwise, you're always in danger of working at cross purposes or with different, you know, with different perceptions. So if we think about education more directly, just before we get to the mapping, I think what's really important for me is, I, this is a really useful diagram actually. So a lot of what I talk about, a lot of what you'll be talking about in this course is the top of the triangles, practices and identity. You know, what are our practices? Who are we? How does that relate to our practices, whether that's a teaching practice or something else? So it's the top of the triangle. But it's worth saying that obviously without access and awareness and certain literacies or skills, it's quite difficult to then talk about practices and identity. So this whole, so whilst I'll be talking very much about the top of the triangle, I just want to acknowledge that the bottom of the triangle is really important. Now, that doesn't mean that this is a ladder. I think this is one of the dangers with these kind of diagrams is it makes it look like you learn everything about access and awareness, everything about skills, and then you can do some practices and then you can do some identity. The truth is this is always cycling around in lots and lots of tiny loops. It's much more messy than this diagram looks. I think that's the same with things like Bloom's taxon taxonomy as well. You know, it isn't just a ladder that you climb. It's something that you're constantly looping around. Um, so we're going to be sort of towards the top of the triangle, but that doesn't mean that the other bits are important. Now, I don't know how many of you will have heard of the term digital natives, the idea of digital natives and di digital immigrants. Before I speak to that, because I, I expect some of you are aware of it, I just want to do a very quick exercise. So what I'm going to do is unshare my screen a second. Mm -hmm. And actually, yo, can you drop the URL into chat for the yeah. whiteboard? Just give me one second. Um, where is the chat? I lost my chat window here. I, I dropped that on you kind of without. Yeah, any... uh, no. So 
if you if you hit that link in the chat you'll go to a whiteboard and what i'd like you to do is when you get there is to answer that question what do you think we mean when we say digital native you know what's what what does that phrase mean digital native so hopefully you should get to this oh look there's a swarm this i've it's decided to call this a collaborative yeah i've decided to call it a collaborative swarm okay now you can use i think there's probably an actual text tool so if you use the text tool you'll you'll find it's much easier than draw, than writing by hand so just have a think it's great to see so many people whizzing around in there have a think about what what does dig, what does the term digital native mean to you and here's some text coming in there and there's some delightful squirrely shapes as well which i like comfortable with social networkings there born before the time of the internet that's an interesting one Somebody simply typed the word text. A person who's grown up in the digital age, people who are born into the digital world, almost like native speakers. Yeah, so we're seeing some themes emerging here. Oh, and a post-it note. And a stick man. I think somebody's drawing a bouquet of flowers, which I also heartily, you know, thumbs up for that too. I've got this thing that I want to write that I've not got around to about digital mess. I love the way these spaces become really, really messy. It's, it's really heartening to see a bit of mess when everything's online. Okay, so keep, if, you, if you're still typing, then, then, then keep going with that. It's great to see that. I think just, I'm just going to step back from this session just for a split second, just to, just to highlight that moments like this where everybody's scrolling over a whiteboard i really feel like i'm in the same place as all of you guys like almost more than i do but that when i'm staring at everybody's video windows so i think these kind of spaces of like co-presence are really really useful when everything's online because it feels like we're doing something together now even though it's like very messy so yeah uh the the the, the idea of the digital native was was sort of put forward by Mark Prensky about 20 years ago. And the theory was that if you, if, you, if you grow up with digital technology around you, then your use of that digital technology is almost like speaking a, a first language, it's sort of innate. But if you are older, and so the digital technology appears when you're an adult, then your use of the technology, you, it's more like you're an immigrant into the technology and your use of it's a bit like speaking a second language. Now, because, it, because the idea appeared in 2000, actually, he was talking about computer games. So the person who put someone who grew up using computer games has probably got the most precise interpretation. But it subsequently uh, became applied to things like social media and stuff like that. Now, the, 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 the downside of that idea was that a lot of people, especially in universities, interpreted that idea as young people are good at technology and old people aren't. Now, I don't think that's true. I think it's too simplistic, but also it kind of gave us an excuse to ignore a whole generation of people that we use that had access to digital technology, but weren't necess didn't necessarily have the literacies they need to make the most of it, if you see what I mean. So you've used all sorts of literacies to interpret that question. Only one of them is your ability to click on a link at, and use that whiteboard, right? Um, and so I think that the risk with natives and immigrants is it, is it became simplified right down to young people are good with technology. And who are those young people? I mean, the original digital natives are going to be you know, in their late thirties now, I guess. So it's, it's not entirely unhelpful, but I think it got interpreted in a, in a way that wasn't unhelpful. So I'm, what I'm going to do now is switch to back to the slides. Thank you for that. It's good to see stuff all over the screen there. And hopefully you've been reading each other's comments. Mythical creatures are fun one. Uh, let me see if I can find the right share here. Okay, and we're back. So the easiest way to, a colleague of mine, 
once said, we confuse ownership with capability. So, you know, if we see our students or colleagues with a really the latest phone or an amazing looking laptop, then we imagine that they must be really good at using it. <laughs> but, you know, being good at Facebook doesn't make you good at research, for example. <laughs> um, I think that's quite a useful way of thinking about it. I actually had an onstage debate with Mark Krinsky about this, and I got really, really vexed. <laughs> I got quite angry. <laughs> um, partly, it was main. It wasn't so much around the immig immigrants and natives idea. It was more that he kept characterizing higher education in a way that I didn't think was accurate, and then would critique that characterization. <laughs> and I was like, but, it's, "But higher education isn't like that." So, so. Uh, I had to rush to the airport after that because I was so annoyed. Anyway, back in the days when we went to airports, here's some data that came from my institution that sort of refutes that idea, you know, that actually um, a lot of people were questioning that idea when we did this research at UAL. You can see that a lot of students are actually quite anxious about sharing their work because maybe maybe they're comfortable sharing in a social context on social media, but actually that doesn't mean that they're not that they're going to be um, comfortable sharing their scholarly work or their student work because that's a whole different that's a whole different type of risk, and an awful lot and I think I think this is well recognised. An awful lot of students just feel overwhelmed by the amount of information they receive and. A really sophisticated literacy is that kind of information filtering. I mean, that's what it is to be a scholar and a researcher, actually. It's your ability to kind of discard information is, is the art of it, uh, rather than find information, if you see what I mean. That's sort of turned on its head in the last 20 years. So what I'm going to do now, and I'm going to hand over to you guys to do another thing in a second, is just go through... We're going to make our own maps of our own online engagement. And these maps you guys can use to kind of reflect on for yourselves. They're good. They're a good thing to write a blog post around. Top tip when you're on this course. Um, so I'm going to just go through the process of, of how we're going to do the mapping. And then we're going to do the mapping. And then we're going to talk about it a bit. Okay. So this is an idea called visitors and residents. And it, it's, this is a slide I made a few years ago. It's, it's an alternative to natives and immigrants. And the big difference is that rather than being a generational distinction or a tech skill distinction, it's based around the idea of motivation to engage. And what I've found is that the concept of motivation to engage is always a useful question to ask, especially when we're thinking about students. So it's a simple question. What's their motivation to engage in what I'm providing? Uh, sometimes, if something doesn't work, you ask that question and you discover there's no motivation for them to engage. So just the other day at a conference I was helping run, we were having that discussion about should students switch their cameras on or not in online sessions? Because one of the participants was shocked that none of the students switched their cameras on in her early teaching sessions during lockdown. And so I simply ask the question, what's their motivation for switching their camera on? Unless they understand teaching as a collective, teaching and learning as a collective endeavor, there's no motivation for them to switch their camera on. It's just all downside. If you're explicit about that kind of philosophy of it being collective and therefore we need to connect with each other, then there's a motivation to switch your camera on. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong or right to switch your camera on. It's just more of that kind of that broader point. I'm getting distracted. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain this continuum. We're going to use it as the basis of our maps. And the easiest way to explain the continuum is to just explain either end of it. Of it. But it's important that you know it's kind of a sliding scale. How are we doing time? Not too bad. So at the visitor end of the continuum, you're going to be, uh, when you go online, when you use digital technology, you, you're going you're gonna to have a job to do. You're going you're to have something you want to achieve. So the easiest way to think about that is that as the web is like a, 
an untidy toolbox of useful things. You decide what you want to do. You open up that toolbox. You rummage around for the rummage is probably not a word that translates very well. You search through the, tool, to the toolbox to find a relevant tool, you use it, and then you put it back and close the lid. So there's some examples there on the screen. And what's really important about this mode is you're not leaving a social trace online, okay? You might be leaving a data trace, but you're not leaving a social trace. So things like searching, reading Wikipedia, doing your banking, you know, there's some examples there. At the other end of the continuum, the resident mode, in, in many ways, you're thinking of the web as a series of spaces or places. So right now, we're in a space, I'd say, a digital space, because we're co-present with each other. And when you're in resident mode, your motivation for going online is to connect with or be co-present with other people. And you will leave a social trace of some sort. So, that, so for example, there might be a recording of this session, or we might tweet about it while we're doing it. I can see you guys, you were writing all over the screen. So you're going to have some kind of identity that's attached to that activity. And you can see examples there. Main example would be social media, but there's all sorts of other things as well. You know, some people are really socially present in email. It's not specifically the technology. It's more about the, the mode in which you're using it. So resident mode or visitor mode, one is not better than the other. It's all about what you're trying to achieve. Somewhere in the middle is where a lot of what goes on online happens. So it's where it, it, it's that's. To be fair, that's probably what this session is, is where you're in resident mode, but, it, but there's kind of an edge to it. So I know that there's 77 participants here now. I can get a sense of the room. Uh, a lot of what we do is within kind of known networks or communities, but we're connecting with other people. It's not just out there, completely out there online. Whereas at the extreme end of resident mode, that's the, that the kind of stuff that you leave behind is the kind of stuff people can, can Google their way to. So like for me, Twitter is an extremely resident mode platform in that sense, because it's very, very visible, very visible. Okay, so the last thing that we do is then add another axis to give us a context, because this is one of the things we found when we were developing this is that context is really, really important as I was saying about students, how they felt about sharing stuff. So in a personal context, they might be happy to share stuff all over the web. In an institutional context, perhaps they'll be more wary of that. So the way that we engage online shifts radically depending on the context for some people. For other people, it doesn't shift at all, but that's one of the interesting things about it. So what I'm gonna do is just very quickly give you a review of my map and then if you can grab a pen and a piece of paper, or you can do it on a tablet digitally, I'm going to ask you to make your own map in a second, and we're going to upload them to a Padlet. So just to give you a feel of it, like here's my map, or a version of my map. It's changed quite a bit, actually. I need to update this. But if you look at the resident end of things, you can see Twitter's quite a big block there. And that's because if you ask the question, I need to find Dave, online, where is he? I'm very resident in Twitter, to the extent that people in my team will send me a direct message in Twitter instead of emailing me, because they know I'll see it first. And I mainly talk about work, so that's why it's largely in the institutional quadrant. Occasionally, I'll, I'll, I'll post other things. I blog, but it's always about work. It's very much attached to my identity, so again, there's a visibility to it. People can post comments. Normally, people will comment on the blog post in Twitter. So there's a relationship between those two things. So the blog is very resident because it's very much me out there, but it's very much institutional because it's always about these kind of things that I'm talking about here. Now, if we go to the other side of the map, I've got email personal up in the top left because I'm not chatting in email. I just use it to organize things. So it's personal. It's very visitor. It's very dry, I guess. Uh, I got email work, where perhaps I'm a little bit more chatty, but it's strictly institutional. And then you get things in the middle, like 
Google Docs or all the Google services, you know, Office 365, stuff like that, where in actual fact, for me, that's just a big mess of personal and institutional things. And sometimes it's visitory, sometimes it's residency. I think these services are really interesting. You know, there's an interesting example is, let's say you're in a Google Doc typing away on your own, you've invited other people to come and edit. When you're typing on your own, it's kind of like a tool. As soon as other people arrive and start typing alongside you, it's become a place. Do you see what I mean? And you can feel that shift, can't you? You suddenly start thinking about what you're doing differently because there are other people there. So quite a lot of things end up in the middle. Okay, that's it. That's enough from me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my screen just so that I can just check how we're doing in chat. Oh, there's lots of chat. That's great. Um, if you want, uh, hopefully everybody's happy to start drawing their own map now. We're going to take sort of a few minutes to make a first version of our map. It is a messy process. It's not accurate. Um, the, the, the reflections that you have when you look at your map or the discussion that you can have when you, when you look at each other's maps, the discussion that it kind of engenders or encourages is more important than the map itself. So just have a go at making your map. Get stuff down onto it. Don't think about it too hard. You can always adjust it later or go back to it. Nobody ever gets everything down first time or in the right place. You can draw the map, Ulrika, on just on using pen and paper. And then what I'm going to ask you to do is if you've got a smartphone, I'm going to, in a second, give you a link to a Padlet where you can take a picture of it on your phone and upload it to the Padlet. If you're not comfortable doing that or uh, you know, wrangling the technology just feels like too much like hard work, don't worry. We don't need everybody to post their maps to be able to have an interesting discussion. So I'm just going to leave you to do that for a couple of minutes and then I'll give you the Padlet link. Do shout in chat if you are, st are stuck. I mean, you know, that's, that's a thing in itself, isn't it? Admitting that you're stuck on something in front of 76 other people that you don't necessarily know that well. There's the option there to uh, send private, private chat. Private yes, chat. I just thought of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just... I'm just very mindful of when I ask people to do things that would make me anxious if I was a student. <laughs> Some great inputs on the aspects of camera. Yeah. Yeah, it's an, it was a really interesting subject, I think. Uh, my view is that when we, if we get back to our buildings face to face, people are going to be really shocked when they find they can't switch their face off. So like, you know, you just look really blank or angry in a meeting and everybody can actually just see you. <laughs> people are going to be, this is an invasion of privacy. You, I can't switch my face off. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and okay. You wish I'm you put... can uh, take host rights and mute uh, people you don't want to hear their opinions. But, uh... Yeah, or just you know be making a sandwich. <laughs> to be totally honest, I do usually have a bit of work lined up at the start of a work day that I can do in irrelevant meetings. <laughs> I'm getting a lot of work done. Okay, so I've just put the Padlet link. I think that's the right one, isn't it, York? into yeah, the chat. I'm pretty sure I yeah. So when you get to the point that you feel like you've got a rough first version of your map, you don't have to hurry, but also don't be too precious about it. Click on the Padlet link and you will go to a place that has a little plus so pink circle in the bottom right hand corner. You can click on that and upload a picture 
of your map. The easiest way to do it is just to do that all on your smartphone. You can go to the Padlet, click on the plus sign, choose the camera option, and at that point, take a photo of the map and it will just upload into the Padlet space. What I'm gonna do now is share the Padlet into the room. So hopefully we can, we'll, we'll see some maps appearing. I've got to find the Padlet myself now. Ah, I know what I know what I'm up to here. It's in a different tab. So I'm seeing I'm actually seeing one that's in there already. So Yeah, and I was blown away. And thank you for the comment because I thought how how good is this to do be oh, able to right. do this in five minutes? But um... <laughs> Let's have a look. Okay, yeah. So that's a very polished map that somebody prepared earlier. Fair enough. There we go. That map that's just come in is a, a, a much more um, reasonable example of what you can do in five minutes in the middle of a workshop when you've never encountered this before. Oh, there's another digital one that's just appeared. There's no hurry to upload your map. Um, we'll just wait for a few more to appear and then we can, we can have a chat. There's a couple more. Great. It's nice to see these appearing. Lovely. So we'll do this for a couple more minutes, just, you know, and then, and then if you, if you, if you want to carry on working on your map and upload it in, in the background as we chat, then obviously that's fine. I've gone quite quickly because I want to get to the bit where we talk about the maps. Look, we're getting a nice screen full here. Fantastic to see so many posts coming in. Uh, it's, yeah, and there's somebody holding up their map to their camera, which works too. I think, I think that's what they're doing. Okay, what I'm going to do is do carry on with that. Now, this is obviously within a workshop that's an, an hour long. You, you know, it can, I think sometimes it's worth doing a really rough map and then sort of walking away from it and having a think about it and going back to it. So this might be a process that you want to, you might want to try a second attempt at a map or add things to it after the workshop. Um, so don't worry if you feel, um, like we're going quickly here. If you if you've got the hang of the mapping process, it you know this is something that you can do with groups of staff. This is something you can do with groups of students. Um, what's useful is is where people see each other's maps because I think it really helps people come to an understanding that that they're engaging differently or they have different expectations. So I'm gonna what I'm gonna do now is just bring a a, a map up in Zoom and then see if that person who did that map wants to talk about it. I think, let's have a look, because it, obviously every time it loads, they, they all move around. I'm just, just out of sheer respect for the work done, I'm gonna ask this, if this person is, is willing to get unmute 
and talk about this map. If you don't want to unmute or you can't for whatever reason, that's fine. Um, hi, whose map is this? This is my map. Hello. Hi. Now, this is, this is very nicely made in an Illustrator. So I'm guessing that you're, you do I'm a bit in, of graphic it's design. I'm it's because I'm a nerd okay. and I, learned how to use Illustrator and like GIS this year and so I'm all like excited about it. <laughs> yeah. So what's um, interesting to me is is you've got Zooms and you, the, over lockdown a lot of these kind of things like Zoom and Teams have appeared as teaching tools that perhaps weren't there before. I guess you're doing a lot of teaching in those kind of environments. Ah uh, yeah. 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 Um, so Right. I, I mean, I noticed that you put um, your email in the visitor space, but I kind of mm -hmm. thought that when you, as soon as you've emailed something, it's kind of there forever. And I use it for really everything. So that's why I put it in um, the center. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how accurate this is or how applicable it is to other people. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of the point is that you, you, you could put email anywhere, depending on how you actually use it. And different people will use it differently and have different expectations. But I could see how the middle would be a good place for email if it's kind of the backbone of everything that you're doing. Mm. Mm. Um, and tell me about you've got what's so which institution you're at it looks like you've got an lms down the bottom there yeah i'm at nus national university of singapore okay and uh -huh. so does that mean that you're doing quite connected things with students in the in the lms then it's more than just throwing content at them well as in la the, this is where they um, submit their assignments and where you uh, we give them feedback on their assignments through the platform. So we re upload yeah. stuff back into Luminous. It's where we, uh, if I read something in the news that I think is interesting to them, or if I want to highlight, let's say I look at a student's blog and it's really impressive and I want my other students to go see it as well, I'll put an announcement up. So I use it on a, sorry, on a daily basis. <laughs> Yeah. I feel like there's an aviary somewhere nearby. Um, it's just one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's really useful to highlight there is I think during lockdown, we, we immediately became obsessed with spaces like Zoom because they, they're sort of a mirror of face-to-face, -face, sort of, but they're not. But it's really useful to highlight, like your example there, that there's lots of ways of being in resident mode that don't involve seeing people's faces on video. <laughs> there's lots of ways of being resident that are asynchronous or close to asynchronous. I think mm. that's got lost a little bit um, because, because, because this technology actually works quite well now, you know, that we've all got glued to it. <laughs> Um, but your example of the way you use your LMS is definitely a kind of connected resident mode, but but not based around synchronous video. And then just just lastly, and then and then we'll we'll have a look at another map. You've got your own website as well, which is very much your writing, I guess. Right, and where I highlight my students' research because I have, you know, um, all their projects up there. So I like to say what they did and what they found so that students who want to come to my lab can you know see if they want to join my lab <laughs> yeah 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 so you connect so you're out there visible and connecting that way that's great thank you yeah. uh joanna mm. i'm gonna i'm gonna have a look at a different map i want i'd like to to, to look at sort of a, a few um i kind of want to have a look at this one because it's bright green um so, and just to highlight, so if this is yours and you want to get on the mic, then say hi. But I really want to highlight that there's no, there's no correct version of a map, if you see what I mean. It's all about, it's all about reflecting on actually what's required to do the work that you need to do. Is, is somebody 
here to speak to this map. I'm here. <laughs> ah, hi. Hello. Lovely. Hello. So it looks like you're pretty um, so I... active on the resident side of things. Yeah, and I just realized I forgot to include my learning management system on here. <laughs> uh, people do that all the time, yeah. Yeah, so our, the learning management system which we use at um, Vasti College is um, Blackboard Learn. So I've been, we've been highly active, well, I've been very active on there actually because it's um, the point where students usually submit their work. We have our live discussions with them and we've been conducting class on that platform as well. And then from a work point of view to connect with our colleagues, we've been using Microsoft Teams, so yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you, you're obviously quite you're, you're obviously quite um, visible or quite active in social media generally in a in in like your social life or in a personal capacity as well. Yes, more so Instagram and Twitter and Twitter, not really Facebook. But um, yeah. I'm I, I'm on there now and again, um, but mm -hmm. not as active as I should be. And I'm I'm guessing Skype is at the visitor end because you. You, you kind of only use Skype sort of when you have to, if, if, you, if you like. I mean, uh, sometimes yeah, I so... think things like Teams, quite often people just have all on all the time and just stuff happens. So you're sort of present in it all the time, but perhaps you only switch Skype on when there's an actual thing. Is it something like that? <laughs> So usually if we need to talk and directly interact with a student one-on-one, -on -one, then I've been using Skype. Um, but other than that, it's Skype was mainly just to interact with a student if I needed to one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. But um, yeah, that was about it. And that usually used to happen like once in a while. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sahira. I'm going to go to another map. That's, that's great. Uh, there's, there's, there's quite a few in here, actually. Um, let's have a look at this one. Everybody's going to have to do this. This is a traditional thing to do with a Padlet because there's no easy way to rotate it. So when I do this, everybody has to do this. Um, whose is this, Matt? And you don't have to get on the mic if you don't want to. You see, now that looks like that's a similar map to mine. Do say hi if you're around. And remember to unmute if you want to talk. Um, but I think what's interesting to me is I started doing this mapping process a few years ago. And back then, the resident institutional quadrant was often very, very quiet. And now it's, it's actually rarer to see that empty. So I think what's happened is that those kind of resident modes of engagement have moved very much into the digital, obviously in an ex super extreme way because of lockdown. Um, and I don't think we really appreciate that how extreme that shift's been, and it's been creeping up on us for years. So I, ha I have a very, I have a mild theory that one of the reasons why, it, you know, we actually made the transition to digital when lockdown started relatively smoothly is because we were all really digital before, we just hadn't quite admitted it. So I think that's a good example of someone that's pretty active across the park there. Um, I'm just gonna go to another map. Let's have a look at this one here. I'm doing this randomly, by the way. This is not like a quality control. Oh, we've got LinkedIn and ResearchGate. Again, if, if you wanna get on the mic, then do. So you can begin to see some patterns emerging here with the types of things that end up in certain spaces. But hi, do I hear a mic? Hi, hi there. Yeah, it's. I just want. Hi. hi I there. just realized. I just wanted to ask you. Yeah. What What was that? I realized that maybe Skype, Zoom, and Teams should be more more on the visitor side. Okay. Well, that's fine, but and that's yeah. that's. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I say, as long as it's helping you to kind of think it through, because I think we very, we very rarely take the time to think about the, uh, that uh, that kind of overall map of our digital engagement. We're quite often thinking about one thing at a time, or or just rushing around a lot. I wanted to ask you about Facebook because you, you see, that's always interesting 
it's a good example. Facebook quite often ends up on the visitor side of things, even though it's social media. And I'm guessing you're using Facebook just to check in on people occasionally or to see what's happening, yeah, but you're not I'm not, really active. I'm not so active there. No. Yeah. Um, and you're resident in LinkedIn. So LinkedIn's quite important for you then. Yeah, maybe more research gate than um, okay. so on, but research gate. Um, and what about and Slack? Are you using Slack? Slack we with... have in the group. In the, Great. The group I work with, my closest colleagues, we are sharing products and comments to the products there and files with us because it's more easy when you have really heavy files to share and so on that the email yeah. doesn't go to. So we use it. And, and Slack's a I think Slack's a really good example, as is WhatsApp, of an environment where you can be very, very resident, but it's predominantly text. I, I also think that for students, one of the reasons why WhatsApp became really, really popular is because you could socialize and connect with people without having to put on a great big show of how brilliant your life was, <laughs> which is sort of exhausting because it's just talking. It's not posting tons of stuff. Um, and then you've got a kind of classic email, email on the visitor end. So I guess you've just got personal email and institutional email, but because of the way that you use Slack, perhaps your institutional email isn't, is it, that means you could be very visitory in your institutional email with something like that. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm not really sure of where to put the email actually, because it's, as someone said that it's, it leaves the footprint. It's, mm -hmm. it's there. So I don't know. I mean, I Maybe think it, it should it, be more. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. It just depends how you interpret that idea. Um, it's it's difficult to say, and things move around a little bit depending on how you're using them. Okay, thank you for that, Therese. Um, I think what I'm going to do is go back to my slides. Obviously, you can you can have a look through the Padlet at, at different people's maps and and sort of come up with your own interpretation of what you think is going on. I think what's important is the way that the maps help highlight that different people work in different ways and maybe have completely different modes, even in the same technology. So the, the actual, the platform doesn't mandate the mode of engagement as much as we imagine. We just make assumptions about it. So the, the best example of that is Facebook. You know, Facebook doesn't, when Facebook came out, everybody imagined it was just narcissists parading around in front of strangers. <laughs> but actually, I think probably most of what goes on in Facebook is private messaging between friends, for example. So there are many different modes of engagement within that platform. So in practical terms, if you ask your students whether they use Facebook and they say yes, you're not really finding that much out because you don't necessarily know what mode they're using it in. So what I'm going to do is go back to my slides. Let's have a look. Um, ah, new share. Here we go, Dave. Mm, that's the one I want. Here we are. So we had a discussion. Well done, us. And you know, hopefully the, map, the maps that you make and, and post to your blogs or wherever you put them will be a useful point of discussion throughout the rest of the course. I just very quickly want to go through, and we spent a little bit longer on that than I might do normally, but I think it's partly because there's lots of interesting maps appearing. I think one of the ways we can look at what's going on out there from a sort of theory point of view is this difference between network and hierarchy. So, you know, a traditional, a traditional educational institution tends to be fairly hierarchical, the actual institution itself, a university, for example, or a school or a college. But obviously the web is, is very networked. What we're doing at the moment is pretty networked. It's also hierarchical because I'm the one that's, I'm the one that's talking a lot. <laughs> I'm the one that's kind of controlling the flow of the session, right? So let's not imagine that just because we're doing things in digital spaces that we're being super networked all the time. 
And the point for me is to try and get what's the, what's the best of a hierarchical approach versus the best of a networked approach. You know, we could have all turned up and said, there's no subject for this session. We're going to figure it out as we go. 100% pure open networked. I don't know how well that would have worked. In theory terms, you can look at this as, you know, constructivism versus connectivism. And I think connectivism is something that you may or may not have, have encountered, but it's a useful, it, it's like a, it's like a useful learning theory for, for that kind of digital networked era. Pure connectivism, in my opinion, is borderline impossible. Um, but it's an interesting thing to approach. And I know that this course is constructed on a very connectivist philosophy. This is just this is just a couple of quotes that I got from blogs from the previous run of this course. Um, and I, I really like this comment that to some extent, the form of the course is the content. So this is something that Dave Cormier has spoken about um, a lot in the past, which is the idea that the community is the curriculum. So negotiating the content amongst ourselves. Um, the point is to connect, to collaborate, to co-construct knowledge which we need to contrast with the idea that, that the point of a course is to connect with an expert who's going to somehow beam their, ex their, their knowledge from their head to your head. Um, this, this is a very particular kind of educational philosophy which takes advantage of the connected nature of the digital. I think it also takes advantage of the fact that we have a, like an almost total abundance of information. I think a lot of of, of traditional pedagogies are actually formed around the idea that information is scarce. Let's not forget that 20 years ago, one of the reasons you went to university was to get into the library. So you have, it's interesting to ask the question, well, if knowledge, if information is abundant, what does it mean to teach? And perhaps teaching has shifted from gatekeeping knowledge to actually creating connections. I'm not going to go into that in detail. I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, here's another comment from a blog post. And I, I think this, this sort of comes back to the point, you know, the discussion about having cameras on and off. For me, I, you know, I don't take a side on these things. I think the important thing is to be explicit about what we're trying to achieve with our students, to actually talk about the educational philosophy of ourselves and our courses. I think often we assume that students can understand the approach that we're taking in terms of the sort of philosophy of how we're going about doing it. But in actual fact, I think, it, again, this is where the maps are useful. It's, it's, it's really useful to be really explicit and say, I, I'm, I'm, you know, the way that I've designed this course is so that we learn on this basis. You know, there are bits of it that you just need to know. I'm gonna give you that knowledge. There are other bits where we're gonna construct this knowledge together. There are bits that we're going to do collectively. And obviously it's up to you. It's obviously it's entirely up to you exactly how you do the design. I just think it's useful to be explicit about the design. So I'm going to spin through some maps that I've got in the past very, very quickly. And some of these I'm going to skip over for time, but it doesn't matter. They're just examples, if you like. Here's an example of where Facebook's all over the park, if you like. So that's what I was mentioning earlier. You know, the, the highlighted ones of Facebook. That was from a single workshop. This is one of my favorite maps. This is somebody who's just got email and email, but it came with a note saying, I think that social media is just going to steal my data and sell me lots of adverts, which is certainly a valid opinion. I've never met anybody who couldn't account for the shape of their map. And it's worth noting that this, this person was a PhD student. They might be a brilliant PhD student. This is not you know, the shape of your map doesn't indicate the quality of what you're doing. <laughs> it's all about kind of actually making conscious decisions about how you're engaging. You get visitory maps. You get maps that uh, are split. So you've got somebody there who's got two Twitter accounts. So they've got one for the personal life, one for the professional life. You know, some people like to compartmentalize. Whereas other people, they're completely decompartmentalized and everything's just all together. And, and again, it's worth thinking about that. You know, where do you want to be with that? Because generally speaking, if you don't actively compartmentalize, everything ends up in the middle. 
this is from a very young student. And I, my interpretation of this is that they hadn't yet developed a kind of scholarly identity or professional identity. They were just them. So the vertical axis was kind of not relevant. They were just sort of saying, I just use stuff. I don't really understand what you're talking about, personal and, and <laughs> institutional, because I haven't really developed that identity. I, ha I had one interesting incident a few years ago with somebody who worked in a library who was struggling doing the mapping. And when I asked her, she said, I've realized the library is my life because <laughs> there was nothing that she did that wasn't something to do with the library, including her entire social life. <laughs> I don't know whether she was happy about that or not, but she is, she effectively didn't have a vertical axis. Here's, here's an interesting one, sad face on SharePoint. So you can annotate the maps to kind of indicate how you feel about the different blocks, which is quite interesting. Somebody using different colors. I'm just gonna spin through, you know, a more creative interpretations. And then just to finish off right at the end, and thank you for engaging in this. Uh, you, you, I have used the maps in the past. I did this with 350 people. And then I uh, analyzed that data based on the broad shape of their map. So if you could see at the top, if it was completely filled or which quadrants were filled, and then did a bunch of stuff with that. The most important thing there is if you look in the bottom left-hand corner is age, okay? So this, this map here, the, the, the VR one that's completely filled in as something in every quadrant, when you broke it down, actually, that, oh, I'm going to go back. When you broke it down, the split of uh, ages that had a completely filled in map was completely even. It wasn't like young people have lots of resident stuff and old people don't. And I think I don't know how old you guys are, but I'm guessing that, that, that you know, we're more at the older end of things than the super young end of things in this room. Let's put it that way. And we've seen tons of stuff all over the resident end of things, you know. So I was really pleased to see that come out that way because it kind of demonstrated that actually age, the idea of being a digital native and age doesn't really map. It's more about what are you trying to achieve? Like how quickly did everybody learn how to use Zoom because we were locked down? because we had a motivation to engage. I'm not saying it was easy, but we did it. And then you can add notes, colors. This is a nice one based on the idea of consumer and creator, which is fun for kind of creative arts, but also other things. Generally, you're gonna be more in a creator mode on the resident side of things because you're putting stuff out there. Um, and then arrows because your, your engagement some is usually traveling in different directions. So these are just suggestions of, of ways that you can sort of interpret the maps to add an extra layer to them. How things connect together, notes. I'm going super quickly because we're out of time. This is one of my favorites. That pink area is not real ideal self. This is like an aspirational map, somebody who wanted to be more active in a, in a particular mode. I think that's interesting for students as well. So I'm not trying to sell the mapping to you specifically here. I want to highlight how it can be useful for helping people to kind of come to an understanding of how they're using the digital environment and how they might want to think about their mode of engagement. You know, and you can see how that, that would be important from an educational point of view. It's more about giving you an opportunity to reflect. Um, I'm not going to speak to this. I just want to finish on this because this is one of my favorite quotes. And I think this quote really reflects the philosophy of this course. But I just like the idea that teachers are the arbiter of connections. That would be my view. Views vary. It's not, it's not a right or wrong thing. But that's very different from teachers are the gatekeepers of correct knowledge. <laughs> but actually, if you think about that Kevin Kelly quote that I put up at the start, everything's connected to everything else. The point is, is how do we help our students understand what all those connections mean and start to make connections for themselves? And the digital environment can help us do that. But that's a very kind of pure philosophy there. I'm going to stop there because we're out of time. Thank you for engaging with that and putting all those maps up and being all over the whiteboard. It's great to see so many people here, actually. Brilliant. Is that okay? I'm going to stop. I'll unshare.
Excellent, Dave. Thanks so much. Um, there's been some comments and uh, side talks in the chat as you would love it to be and there's th things going on in Twitter at the same time. Um, so um, hopefully this was a good kickoff for topic one when you can go back to the uh, PBL groups and discuss online participation and digital literacies. Hope that all of you join us next Tuesday as well uh, for a tweet chat with Dave and me and hopefully a lot of you and uh, great opportunity to test it out if you haven't done so. So uh, yeah, and do connect with, uh, with us and with each other and uh, participate and um, um, develop, evaluate uh, if, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, the, <laughs> uh, your, tasks, uh, skills, your practices, your identity in all different spaces. And uh, Dave, thanks so much for this hour. Yeah, thanks all. It's great to see the chat's been so busy. I'm sorry I couldn't follow